Welcome to episode one of our read-along book club of The Memory Police by Yoko Agawa. This is a book that I've been meaning to get to for some time because I bought it a long time ago. I didn't know about it because when this was uh, submitted for uh, your voting, right, for this this read-along book club, I said, man, that, uh, that, that cover looks familiar. The title sounds familiar. And sure enough, I went back to my Kindle library and found it. So it is, it is great to know that I'm finally chipping away at all these books I, I, I find on sales that I haven't gotten to yet. So finally, one down. And I'm liking this book so far. It's, it's reminiscent of A24 films when they do sci-fi anyway. It's, it's quieter. It's a smaller cast. It's not about a uh, spectacle. It's about the human condition, right? It's, 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 it's taking an idea, a what-if idea, and exploring that on the page. And needless to say, it is a slow burn so far. In fact, I'm not even really quite sure what the, uh, the overall plot is going to be. We know that this, uh, this young lady, her, her mother, died after being taken by the memory police, and I'm guessing it's going to go that way, but wouldn't you know it, at the end of chapter 8, we ended on something that is um, quite a cliffhanger. It's illuminating, let's say, so I think it was a good starting point. But let us get into the book and start with the cover, right? Because we get a little gander, we get a little look at this, um, this symbol here, the symbol of the memory police. It's described in the text, and I'm, I'm glad that it was there because the, um, the description of it being hexagonal but with these triangles was a little bit confusing, so it's great that we have an image. And uh, I looked up Yoko Agawa as well, and she's a Japanese writer, so this book was translated. And I'm noticing a trend on uh, translated books uh, from, from Japan anyway. Haruki Murakami, as well as this one, the writing style is particular. It's very plain, it's very simple, it's very kind of matter of fact. There's not a lot of um, color to it. And that's okay, that's okay. I think there's a lot to be said for plain writing. But it, it makes me wonder if it's a cultural thing or if it's a thing where um, when, it's, when it's translated, it comes out this way. I'm not quite sure because I did read... Uh, Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk, I think that is, which is a um, uh, written natively in Polish, and I thought that translation was amazing. So hard to know, but she has written a few other books, clearly. And according to Wikipedia, she has won all of the prestigious awards you can win over there in Japan. And strangely enough, there is no dedication whatsoever, which brings us to chapter one. Chapter one is a, it, basically it's a hook scene. It's, it's a... I, you can't really say it's a flashback because uh, this entire story is told to us in first person from the protagonist's POV. But she takes us back to when she was a child and she says, I sometimes wonder what was disappeared first. And what was disappeared is an interesting way to say that because when I was first uh, reading the description of this, when it was saying, oh, these you know objects are, are disappearing from an island, I thought, meant like, I thought that meant like they're visually disappearing, right? Um, but disappearing, as you know, and this book is very different. It's it's more of a, um, you start to lose uh, the idea of what something is, right? It still exists. We know these people, um, they, they destroy the object um, ceremoniously uh, when something is quote unquote disappeared. Uh, but it's it's a cool concept because it's, it's more interesting than something just physically disappearing, right? It, it's still there, just the notion of what this thing is, right? Uh, the word that is used to describe it, uh, just looking at something and trying to assign meaning to that or, or assign it to your, to your memory, obviously, to comprehend what it is, is completely gone. And that's, that's a cool concept. It's, it's, it's hard to almost imagine what it would be like for uh, you to lose what the concept of something was. But her mother says, long ago, before you were born, there were many more things here. My mother used to tell me when I was still a child, transparent things, fragrant things, fluttery ones, bright ones, wonderful things you can't possibly imagine. And things go on disappearing one by one. It won't be long now, she added. You'll see for yourself, something will disappear from your life. And we know what that something is. And I'm guessing, you know, now reading this again, it feels like this entire story is going to revolve around her mother. At least that's where the plot is building to, because I think we're about 20% into this. And, you know, nothing's really happened yet. It's kind of just setting the stage. It's, 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 it's doing all the world building. And I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, it's a cozy little island. But uh, she goes on to say, One morning you'll simply wake up and it will be over, before you've even realized. Lying still, eyes closed, ears pricked, trying to sense the flow of the morning air. You'll feel that something has changed from the night before. 
and you'll know that you've lost something, that something has been disappeared from the island. And then uh, her mother, we find out, works in the studio in this basement. It's not really technically a basement, but they call it a basement. But it was a large, dusty, rough-floored room built so close to the river on the north side that you could clearly hear the sound of the current. And her mother is a sculptor, was a sculptor. And this is when we learn about what they do if um, it's a physical object that has been disappeared. So if it's a physical object that has been disappeared, we gather the remnants up to burn or bury or toss it into the river. Which is interesting because there's always that, I don't know where the quote, where the quote comes from, but time is like a river, right? Time is this this coursing thing. And so I'm curious to see if, if this river plays that part or if it's just... Um, coming to mind because I've, I've heard that quote before. But then she would interrupt her work to lead me back to the staircase to an old cabinet with rows of small drawers. Go ahead, open anyone you'd like. And here in the secret place, her mother always kept hidden many of the things that had been disappeared from the island in the past. She finds a ribbon that was disappeared when she was just seven years old. And then an emerald, which she goes on to say is very, very important. And of course, here's a stamp, which we know what that is. And they, uh, then they would deliver it uh, to you anywhere at all once you put the stamp on it. But that was a long time ago. Ribbon, bell, emerald, and stamp. The words that came from my mother's mouth thrilled me, like the names of little girls from distant countries or new species of plants. And that's another thing I'd like to bring up. We know that our uh, narrator is a writer. Normally, I kind of roll my eyes at the notion when a, when a writer uh, writes a story with a writer as a protagonist. Stephen King uh, does that quite often. But here it is used in a very interesting way because we have a character who her, her job is creating meaning, creating meaning from nothing, pulling words out of thin air and creating meaning in a world or in this island, this location anyway, where all meaning is being lost. So I think that that is, that is a very perfect uh, uh, setup for this thing. But when I stood before the secret drawers, I felt I had to concentrate on each word my mother said. And her favorite story was one about perfume. It was a clear liquid in a small glass bottle. And she goes to try to drink it because she, she doesn't know what it is. And her mother says, no, 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 don't do that. You put a drop on your neck like this. <laughs> and she asks, why would you do that? Uh, perfume is invisible to the eye, but this little bottle nevertheless contains something quite powerful. And in fact, this is the perfume her mother wore when uh, she and her father were courting. And her mother was at her most lively when she talked about the small bottle. And we know that her, her father as well is gone. I, I love the first opening line of the second chapter because it hits you. It puts everything quickly in perspective. But uh, it was disappeared in the autumn of the year of your father and I were married. So more symbolism here. Some girls held the bottles up to their noses one last time, but the ability to smell the perfume had already faded along with all memory of what it had meant. Perfume had been disappeared from their heads. But I had no idea what to answer. I could tell that there was some sort of scent here, like the smell of toasting bread or the chlorine from a swimming pool, yet, yet different. But no matter how I tried, no other thought came to mind. That's the best way we can sort of understand what it would be like, right, um, to, to have something be disappeared. Because again, like I was saying earlier, it's kind of hard to, to imagine what that is, right? I, I guess if you see something that you've never seen before, like how would you, how would you describe it? But it's, it's cool because... It's with very ordinary, mundane things, right? It's not like things that very few people know about. But then when it turns 9 o'clock, uh, she goes up to go to sleep in her bed. And she asks, Mama, why do you remember all the things that have been disappeared? Why can you still smell the perfume that everyone else has forgotten? And she looked out through the window for a moment, gazing at the moon, and then brushed some stone dust from her apron. I suppose it's because I'm always thinking about them, she said. Her voice a bit hoarse. And her daughter goes on to ask if she remembers everything forever. And she looked down as though this were something sad. So I kissed her again to make her feel better. So a really cool introductory chapter. I mean, it's setting up the concept. It's setting up the relationship with a mother and daughter. Um, it's There's no action there, right? It's a very short, quiet chapter, and which is you know very reminiscent of the rest of the book so far. But let us talk about chapter two. My mother died, and then my father died. And since then, I've lived all alone in this house. And with science fiction, uh, you always are thinking about, well, what kind of technologies would they have that makes your life as a, you know, as a storyteller more difficult? And uh, the interesting thing here is uh, I love sci-fi stories. I love stories in general where people are trapped in a small location. And we find out here that, and since there is no map of the island, maps themselves having long <laughs> since been disappeared, no one knows its precise shape or exactly what lies on the other side of the mountains. 
So that is an easy way to solve that problem. You know, we think of a world and, you know, cell phones and satellites and, and mass communications and all this stuff. Everyone's going to know everything, right? But it's very easily solved right here. And this is when we learn about our father, who was an ornithologist. He worked at an observatory at the top of the hill to the south, and he spent several months a year there collecting data, photographing the creatures, and trying to hatch eggs. And he would take his daughter there, and we find that um, she is uh, wondering, I always wanted to ask him whether he knew what was in the drawers of the old cabinet of her mother's studio. But he would often stay longer at the observatory, and when are you coming home, I'd ask him. Saturday evening, I think, he would tell me, looking uncomfortable. Be sure to give my love to your mother. He waved a goodbye so vigorously that he nearly lost the red pencil, or the compass, or highlighter, or ruler, or tweezers stuffed in his breast pocket. Almost like the, uh, the vigorous waving of a bird wing, even. And this is kind of a weird formatting side note. I know probably nobody even noticed or even cares about it, but normally when you see seam breaks, it's usually asterisks, and they're usually in the center, one or three or five or you know whatever, or maybe it's a line. Something about these ellipses, I, I really like it, these left-justified ellipses. It's almost like um, time passing, right? I think it's, a, it's, it's another cool thing to note about books. And um, my conversation with Matt Evanson, if you haven't seen the, the interview, I, I suggest you check it out. He talks about uh, having the story start before the story or have every aspect of the book be part of the story, right? It's not just uh, the words on the page or what is happening, but using the white space and the words and stuff like that will just become part of the experience. And I thought, I, hopefully that was intentional. I'm not quite sure. But I think it's fortunate that the birds were not disappeared until after my father died. Most people on the island had found some other line of work quickly when a disappearance affected their job. But I don't think that would have been the case for him. Identifying those wild creatures was his one true gift. And down below is where we first find about the, out about the memory police. So of course, had they complained, these people who had to find new work after you know whatever they were doing was disappeared, uh, they might have attracted the attention of the memory police. And we know the memory police are the people who try to uh, round people up who still remember things. We, they, they take them somewhere to an institute. Uh, there's rumors of genetic testing. Uh, and then uh, we know that her mother turned up dead after being taken there. So... Still not quite sure. Hopefully she infiltrates this, this area or finds out the mystery. But the disappearance of the birds, as with so many other things, happened suddenly one morning. And here we get a beautiful description of what it was like, right? She spotted a small brown creature flying up in the sky. It was plump with what appeared to be a tuft of white feathers at its breast. I had just begun to wonder whether it was one of those creatures I had seen with my father when I realized that everything I knew about them had disappeared from inside me. My memories of them, my feelings about them, the very meaning of the word bird, everything. Which is another thing um, that's interesting because she's telling us this story in the past tense and she's using these words. So she knows what they are, even though she forgot what it meant, right? So I, I have to imagine that uh, we're going to have a somewhat of a happy ending at the end of the story. At least uh, uh, things will stop disappearing. Otherwise, maybe it's a plot hole. I don't think it is. I think it's all part of the plan. Yoko Agawa has clearly won many awards, so I'm sure she is a, a very proficient writer in that regard. But this bird, which should have been intertwined with memories of my father, was already unable to elicit any feeling in me at all. So it's interesting we see these objects uh, tied to people. You know, we do that in our lives, right? We... We'll associate uh, certain random mundane things with people because you know, maybe it's a house, maybe it's a chair, maybe it's a book, maybe it's, it's, it's anything at all. Maybe it's a scent even. And I, I love the idea because a guy was really playing with that concept, you know, not only like what things mean, but how they relate to each other. And this again uh, depicts the moment when everybody was saying goodbye to their birds. So each owner seemed to be saying goodbye to his bird in his own way. Some are calling their names, others rubbing them against their cheeks, still others giving them a treat, mouth to beak. So it, it's almost like saying goodbye to a loved one who died, right? Because, who dies because they're not trying to hold on to it, right? They, they, they know what's going to happen. They know it's inevitable. They know they can't fight off uh, forgetting about these things. And so they just kind of go about it, you know, normally saying, hey, this is it. I accept it. And um, this thing will be disappeared. And then in the very next scene, uh, the memory police show up. Take us to your father's office, uh, said one of the officers from the memory police, whom I found standing in the doorway, banging on the door. So uh, she says, my father died five years ago. And he says, we know, said another man, wearing insignia shaped like a wedge, a hexagon, and a letter 
T. And then they go into her father's office. First, one of them opened all of the windows, which had been sealed shut since my father's death. Meanwhile, another one used a long, thin tool like a scalpel to force the locks on the cabinets and the desk drawers. The rest ran their fingers over every inch of the walls, apparently in search of secret compartments. And her mother has those compartments. Uh, when they came upon something they considered dangerous, in other words, anything that contained the word bird, they threw the item unceremoniously on the floor. But as they, as they worked in silence, the only sound was the rustling of papers, like the fluttering of wings. That's a cool piece of imagery right there. But then uh, one of the officers reached for the handle on the bottom drawer of the desk, and she says, there's nothing in there that has to do with birds, she cried out. It was the drawer where my father kept family letters and photographs. The officer, this one wore a badge made of concentric circles, as well as one shaped like a rectangle and another like a teardrop, continued to search. The only offending item in the drawer was a photograph of her family with a brightly colored rare bird. I no long, longer recall, recall the name that my father had managed to hatch from an egg he had incubated. And right here is where we learn of uh, their duty. So the first duty of the memory police was to enforce the disappearances. But then she realized at some point that this search was unlike the day they took her mother away. The room had changed completely. The traces of her father's presence, which I had done my best to preserve, had vanished, replaced by an emptiness that would not be filled. Which brings us to chapter three. I make my living now for my writing. So far, I published three novels, each one the story of something that has been disappeared. And we learn that the libraries aren't very popular. Reading in general is not very popular, but uh, few people have any need for novels, which makes me wonder how is she making money uh, or making a living anyway, writing books that, that nobody really cares about. But I generally begin writing at about two o'clock in the afternoon and keep at it until midnight, nearly midnight, yet I rarely finish more than five pages. I enjoy writing, slowly filling each square on the paper, one character at a time. There's no need to hurry. I take my time. Uh, as a writer myself who procrastinates, who worries about my own productivity, this makes me smile. That's why I highlighted it. Uh, though I've tried, I've found no ways to fill in the voids left by the memory police. The ferry had been tied to the dock for a very long time, and, and it is now completely covered with rust. No passengers boarded. It can no longer take them anywhere. It, too, is among the things that have been disappeared from the island. And it, we, we learn about this man here. Her nurse's husband had once served as a mechanic on the boat. Uh, he's a cool guy. She, she brings him things. She always brings him his bo her books. Uh, she even made him a sweater. But now he lives on the abandoned boat because there's nothing left to do. But they sit down and they talk about writing. And uh, he says, there aren't many people who can sit all day at a desk and make up such complicated things right out of their head. If your parents were here to see you, they would be so proud. But she says, humbly, a novel isn't as marvelous as all that. To me, taking apart a boat engine, an boat engine, fixing it and putting it all back together, again, is much more mysterious and wonderful. So uh, she doesn't believe that what she does has, has really any value or that it's difficult at all. She, she views the world in a different way, right? She views the things she can't do as, as marvelous. Uh, but I, I, that's what we do, right? You know, when, when somebody can't play an instrument, we all look upon them with awe, or those people do anyway, and, and they just can't conceive of, of, of how they could do such a thing, even though they themselves could be very good at something. But she graciously always gives him one of her first copies of each one of her books, although he doesn't read them. And I love this because, what does he say right here? I couldn't possibly say, he said, if you read a novel to the end, then it's over. I would never want to do something as wasteful as that. I'd much rather keep it here with me, safe and sound forever. That's one thing I've noticed about this book. There's these... um. There's so many bits of little wisdom in it, you know, these, these, these little lines of dialogue that really just give you pause and make you think, and they're, they're almost like a, a parable in themselves, and I, I, I love that about this book so far. But leaving the harbor behind, her next stop was the observatory at the top of the hill, and silence fell around us all, as though we were stealing ourselves for the next disappearance, which would no doubt come, perhaps even tomorrow. And so it was that evening came to the island, which brings us to chapter four. On Wednesday afternoon, on my way to take my manuscript to my publisher, I had an encounter with the memory police. And we find out it was the third time since she'd seen them since this month, and they seemed to grow a bit more brutal each time. In 15 years since they first appeared, uh, in those days it was just becoming obvious that some people, like my mother, did not lose their memories of the things that had disappeared, and the memory police began taking them all away. The truck stopped in front of a building that housed a dentist's office, an insurance company, and a dance studio. Ten men from the memory police jumped out and hurried into the building. And this is when they're, they're taking people out, right? They're, they're holing up in these safe houses, trying to not be taken by these memory police. And that is what she's witnessing right here. 
A short time later, the sound of footsteps could be heard coming from the building, the forceful rhythmic boots of the memory police mixed with quieter, more uncertain steps. Then a line of people emerged, two middle-aged gentlemen, a woman in her 30s with dyed brown hair, and a thin girl barely in her teens. It seemed they had been trying to bring with them as many useful items as they were able to carry. And now they were being marched out of the building with weapons at their backs. And those eyes, no doubt, were all sorts of memories that had been lost to us. They were loaded one after the other into the back of one of the trucks, and the guns trained on them the entire time. The little girl, she falls out, and, and uh, our, our narrator cries out before I could stop myself and drop my envelope. The pages of my manuscript scattered all over the sidewalk, and the other bystanders turned to look disapprovingly. They were afraid of creating a disturbance, of giving the police reason to notice them too. But after the aftermath, she stood waiting at the door of the building, uh, now tightly shut, and wondered how the officer's hand must have felt to the young girl as they pulled her into the truck. Which brings us to a new scene. I saw something terrible in my way here, I told R, my editor, in the lobby of the publishing house. And this, I believe, is when she's learning about the, uh, the genetic testing, or, well, R thinks he knows what's going on. But, it, but today was different somehow. Now they took four people at once from the entire, from the center of town in broad daylight. As far as I know, they've generally acted at night on the edge of town, taking just one member of a family. And this is where we are learning they've been hiding in a safe house. But I've heard that there's a fairly large underground network that creates these safe houses and then keeps them running, which makes me wonder, is that uh, something she's going to get into? We know that People who are being pursued by the memory police come to her later in this this section. She hasn't gone beyond that, so we shall see. There's still plenty of book left to go. It's always struck me as odd that the police can tell who they are. And this is when um, he brings up the conscious mind is embedded in a subconscious that's 10 times as powerful, which may make trying to pretend almost impossible. They can't even imagine what these disappearances mean. And that that's got me thinking again, like how easy would it be to pretend that you don't remember what something is. I think that would be extremely difficult, especially with all of the, the things that seem to go disappeared, right? Um, they're, all, they're all basic things everybody knows about. And this is when he talks about they're learning to analyze our genes to find out who has this trait, this mysterious trait that allows them to um, remember. And well, we know R has this trait. We know our mother has this trait, if it is a genetic trait at all, which means Maybe she has an ability to remember. But she asks, how did they get her genes? And he responds with, you just drank from this cup, didn't you? R said, stubbing out a cigarette and lifting my coffee cup to eye level. I nodded. They could take this and isolate your genetic material from your saliva. So very easy to do. And she continues to ask why they are taking people away. The island is run by men who are determined to see things disappear. From their point of view, anything that fails to vanish when they said it should be is inconceivable. So they force it to disappear with their own hands. So very totalitarian government. Uh, clearly, like I said, this book is obviously inspired by 1984 with a thought police. But it seems strange that you can still create something totally new like this, just from words, on an island where everything else is disappearing. So we are told, literally, from a character what we're thinking ourselves and, and how um, she is very unique in this situation, that she can just pull things from thin air, right, when everything else is disappearing. Which brings us to chapter 5. And autumn passed quickly. The crashing of the waves was sharp and cold, and the wind brought the winter clouds from beyond the mountains. The old man came from his boat to help me prepare for the cold weather. And they talk about that it hasn't snowed in a very long time, and she just finished knitting a sweater that she'd like him to try, and I believe it was longer in the sleeves and tighter around the neck, but he seemed pretty okay with it. And this is when we learn about um, her new novel she's working on. She's hiding away at home working on her new novel. This one was about a typist who loses her voice. And what was kind of cool, I didn't quite get what's happening here. It seems really obvious in hindsight because the font changes, but we actually get uh, snippets or, or excerpts of what she's writing. And, and the first one I really enjoyed because it meanders. It doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. But she notes, I myself wasn't sure what would happen next. The story seems simple and pleasant enough, but I had a feeling it might take a frightening turn. Does that mean she's going to be able to control reality with her writing? I don't know. That's my guess. We'll see where it goes. And this is when she's working well past midnight, and she thought she heard someone knocking on the glass off in the distance, coming from the basement. She could see someone standing outside the door that led to the laundry area built on the river. And then she finds out who it is. It is Inui. When I opened the door, I found Professor Inui and his family standing outside. Inui, an old friend of my parents, taught in the dermatology department at the university hospital. So we found out they've been summoned by the memory police, and they're trying to go into hiding into these safe houses. 
And uh, she's been ordered to present herself at the Genetic Analysis Center. Her whole family is to move to the center. And she's trying to find out where it is, but they have no idea. But she remembered then what R had told her, so it wasn't just a rumor. Genetics were, in fact, the way they were finding these people. But they are offering to triple his salary if he goes. And uh, we find out that just like the letter for your mother that came 15 years ago, and we know what happened to her mother. We also find out that when uh, her mother was taken away, the Inuits had comforted her at the time. She was just a little girl, and their daughter was a baby in her mother's arms. But I had been fairly certain that it had something to do with the drawers in the chest in the basement where all of the things she remembered. The car sent the next morning by the memory police was terribly elegant, jet black and polished to a brilliant shine. But she got in, her mother did, but that was the last time we ever saw her alive. Her body came back to us a week later along with her death certificate. It listed the cause of death as a heart attack. An autopsy was performed at Professor Inouye's clinic, but nothing suspicious was found. But the quality of the paper, the font on the typewriter, even the watermark, it was all exactly the same as the one that came for your mother. Mrs. Inui had two scarves around her neck, not a tightly in front. Her eyelashes fluttered as she spoke. And it doesn't matter, as she notes here, that if they refuse, because they will just take her by force. And this is when we find out they are going to a safe house. And this is when we find out that her mother gave these people, um, this family, a bunch of sculptures of hers. And they ask her if she will keep them while they are away. And her mother made this taper for us as a wedding present, this one she gave us with our own daughter was born. And the other three we received the day before she went away with the memory police. The other three were different. They were abstract, puzzle-like objects made of both wood and bits of metal, small enough to fit in the palm of your hand. They were rough to the touch, neither sanded nor varnished. It almost seemed that they could be combined to form a single object. And yet the three were distinct and bore no resemblance to one another. So is this going to be a magical Hellraiser <laughs> puzzle box that solves the problem of the memory police? I don't know. We'll find out. Or solves the problem of the disappearances anyway. And she went up to the kitchen, heated some milk, and poured them into mugs because she feels bad. These, these people, this family, they did a lot for her when her mother was gone. So she wants to give them some cozy little warm snacks, I guess. And this was a little curious ending to the scene. I'm, I'm, I wonder if there's going to be some significance to this at some point. But she, uh, Mrs. Inui asks, um, could I trouble you for a nail clipper? His fingernails have gotten so long. She took the boy's hand in hers. Of course, she said. But then she's the one who carefully clips his nails, starting from the little finger on his left hand. The nails were soft and transparent and came away with the least effort, fluttering to the floor like flower petals. Oh, wow. So I didn't pick that up uh, before, but now we know she is definitely seeding this stuff, which is awesome uh, because we know the very last thing that uh, people that goes disappeared in this in this group of chapters are the roses and there's flower petals everywhere so i love going through this twice good stuff and when she finished the sky blue gloves were waiting on the table and that is how the inui family vanished which brings us to chapter six i climbed the staircase so narrow i wondered how i'd get past should i meet someone coming down so this is her story i don't know why it's not in the courier font like it is on my kindle when i read it here Maybe the web can't display it very well, but this entire section is very bizarre, and it's uh, it's the book she's writing, and she's talking about a lighthouse. She's talking about, I went with an older cousin who licked my cuts one by one. More bizarre stuff. But she's uh, going through this place, which she isn't quite sure what it is, but I would have been about seven or eight years old, dressed in a pink lace skirt my mother had made for me. And she hears a sound, and suddenly, as it grew louder, the smell of oil grew stronger, though at the time... I was not sure I was smelling what I was smelling. At first, I thought it might be something poisonous that was floating up through the tower. But now she is in a clock tower of a church. You can see how the story is kind of weaving and finding its way. It's, it's somewhat lost, and which is cool because a lot of times when you're writing, that's what happens. You're just sort of uh, figuring it out as you go, and that's very representative sometimes of, of where plot lines might take you. Uh, but my lover waits for me in the room halfway up where they teach typing. And that is when we learn this is the story she's working on right now about the uh, the woman who can't speak, so she's got to type everything. But having written this phrase, I set down my pencil. My new novel wasn't going very well. And this is when she's um, remembering something that, that R told her. Uh, you can't write with your head. I want you to write with your hand. Not sure what that means. I, I, I'm guessing that means just don't think. Let your subconscious take over. Maybe it'll have some more meaning later on. But in bed, I found myself thinking about the Inuit family. Since that night, I had passed the faculty house at the university any number, any number of times. And this is when, yeah, she stops by 
Uh, but it seems like nobody cares, right? It's it's just business as usual, essentially. Yeah, no one wondered where the professor had gone or lamented lamented his absence. And then when she opened her eyes the next morning, something else had disappeared. It had grown colder, and there was frost in the garden. Everything in the house, my slippers, the faucet, the heater, the rolls in the bread box was chilled. So a very, very cold time. This is when she sees these, these uh, petals. So I could hear... The faint sound of flowing water and above it the sound of footsteps, adults and children together running toward the alley in the back and the dog next door barking and settling sounds I knew from experience of a morning when something had disappeared. There they stood, all in a group, the former hat maker, the unfriendly couple from next door, the dog with brown spots and some school children with their backpacks. They were staring at the river in silence. The surface of the river was covered with tiny fragments of something in an indescribable array of hues, reds, pinks, and whites, so thick that not a space was visible between them. But then she plunges her hands into the stream, and when she held them in front of herself, uh, her palms were covered in rose petals. Then petals covered the surface as far as the eye could see. I'm curious if there's some kind of significance uh, with, with rose petals in Japanese culture. That's something I probably should have looked up before making this video. But her plan was to follow the river upstream to the rose garden on the slope of the hill. But the memory police, too, were out in force more so than usual. But needless to say, not a single flower was left in the rose garden. The few flowers in the garden other than the roses had survived. Bell flowers, a couple of spiny cacti, some genetians, they bloomed discreetly as though embarrassed to have been spared. The breeze seemed to discriminate, choosing only the rose petals to scatter. Hands thrust in my pockets, I wandered across the hill as though walking through a cemetery of unmarked graves. That's a cool image as well. But in years past, I had carefully studied the stems, leaves, and branches and had, the, had read the tags that identified the different varieties, but I realized now that I was already unable to remember what this thing called a rose had looked like. So that is this period, which brings us to chapter 7. Already on the second day, people who had raised roses in their gardens came to the river to lay their petals to rest. So more personification here. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see people take these. Before it was birds, right, where we learned about that, and that makes more sense because at least they're they're conscious creatures, at least as far as we understand. But rose petals, it's, it's interesting. And she tells this woman, what lovely roses you have. And she says, thank you. They won the gold medal at last year's fair, you know. My comments seem to have pleased her. They're the last and most beautiful memento I have my late father. So again, we're assigning meaning to these objects. The last things that these people remember about these people or that associate with these people. And that's, that's even more devastating. In a three days' time, the river had returned to normal with no visible change in the color or the level of the water. I wonder how the wind could tell the roses from all the other flowers, I said, as I rubbed my finger along the rail, dislodging some flakes of rust. There's no way of knowing, he said. The only thing we can know for sure is the roses are gone. He was wearing the sweater I'd knitted for him and his work pants from the days as a mechanic. But what's to come of the rose garden? And that's nothing for you to worry yourself over. Maybe some other flower will bloom there or they'll plant fruit trees or turn it into a graveyard. And we learn this man, he, he doesn't like to go out much, except, except, except when one of her books comes out. Then I want to make sure they had put it on the shelf, in the library, of course. And he goes all the way up there to see her books. And a whirlpool of rose petals had formed around the motionless propeller of the boat. They were wilted and wrinkled and traveling downstream to salt water. Their color and luster had faded, and they were now nearly indistinguishable from the seaweed and the fish bones and trash, and their fragrance had dissipated. What will your gardener friend do now? I asked. He is already retired. At our age, there's no need to look for another job, so there's nothing to worry about with the memory police. He can just forget about tending those roses with so many other things to occupy him, cleaning his grandchildren's ears or plucking fleas from his cat. <laughs> All sorts of things. And this is when the narrator brings up something that is probably on all of our minds as we read this. I mean, things are disappearing more quickly than they're being created, right? And he nodded and furrowed his brow, like someone suffering from a headache. What can people on this island create? I went on. A few kinds of vegetables, cars that constantly break down, heavy, bulky stoves, some half-starved stock animals, oily as cosmetics, babies, the occasional simple playbooks, but no one reads. If it goes on like this and we can't compensate for the things that get lost, the island will soon be nothing but absences and holes. And when it's completely hollowed out, we'll all disappear without a trace. Don't you ever feel that way? I suppose so, he murmured, repeatedly pushing up the sleeves of his sweater and then pulling them back down in a manner that seemed more and more agitated. Maybe because you write novels, you come up with these extreme ideas. So He's not even thinking about this. She had to bring it up to mind. But not one memory of the fairy remains here, I said, glancing up at him. It's nothing more than a floating scrap of iron. That doesn't make you sad? It's true. 
I know that there are more gaps in the island than there used to be. When I was a child, the whole place seemed, how can I put this, a lot fuller, a lot more real. But as things got thinner and more full of holes, our hearts got thinner too, diluted somehow. I suppose that kept things in balance. And even when that balance begins to collapse, something remains, which is why you shouldn't worry. And then dusk was falling over the sea. And no matter how long I peered into the distance, I could no longer make out the petals. Another thing that disappeared. I like how these uh, chapters are ending. I, I wished I would have paid more attention uh, the first time around, jotted notes, because you can see a pattern emerging, right? Things are disappearing with every chapter. And now, chapter eight, we are back to her book. It will soon be three months since I lost my voice. Now nothing passes between the two of us except by means of the typewriter. And what should I get you for your birthday? He asked one day, and I lowered my eyes to his knees where my typewriter was usually perched, and she would like an ink ribbon. The reason why she wants that, even though he notes it's not very romantic, is because she's worried that they'll disappear and we won't be able to talk anymore. I understand. I'll go to the stationers and buy every last one they have. And this is when she remembers about how he taught her to change one of these ribbons when she was back at school. He says, before you go home today, he told us, you'll know how to change a typewriter ribbon. Watch carefully. And he meticulously goes through this process, but still, she was never able to learn how to change a ribbon in his class. Inevitably, it would get tangled and nothing would appear on the paper, no matter how much she typed. But now she's a pro at it, clearly, because it's the only way she can speak. Since I started using the typewriter in place of my voice, I use up a ribbon in about three days, but I no longer throw away the old ones. Somehow, I have the feeling my voice may come back one day if I study the letters imprinted on the used ribbon. And that's another interesting thing. She's not using a computer, so it makes you wonder if she's writing about something in the past or, or when does the story take place? I guess we never really know. I know it is sci-fi technically, but it doesn't have to be the future. It just has to be um, a, a science fiction style concept. I showed R what I'd written. Since there were quite a few pages, he came to my house so I wouldn't have to carry the bulky manuscript. And he tells her they should stop for the day and in the kitchen, she sliced some cake, made some tea, and carried everything in the living room. Is this your mother? He asked, pointing to a photograph on the mantel. It is. She was very beautiful. And you look a great deal like her. No, my father used to say that the only thing I inherited from my mother was my good teeth. Teeth are important. My mother always kept dried sardines wrapped in newspaper on the desk in her studio, and she would snack on them as she worked. If I got fussy in my playpen, she would slip one in my mouth to quiet me even before I had my teeth. I still remember the way they smelled, mixed with the odors of sawdust and plaster. They were awful, gritty things. And speaking of memories and speaking of meaning, right, she notes that the only R I knew was the one who read my manuscripts. I knew nothing else about him, not his childhood, nor his family, how he spent his Sundays, his preference in women, or his favorite baseball team. When we were together, he did nothing but read my writing. And he asks, do you still have many of your mother's works here? I think she must have hidden some of them just after she received the summons from the memory police. And this is when she goes into the uh, the basement, quote-unquote basement, but the front of the house is along the road to the south, but in the back to the north it faces a river. The stone foundation was set down into the water with a house built on top of it, so the basement is actually below the level of the water. And he asks if she will take him there, and she does. But after my mother died, my father couldn't bear to come here, so it's falling apart. And he goes, R, and he examines some things, odds and ends, cabinets full of my mother's tools, the five sculptors entrusted to me by the Inuits that were lined up on the top shelf. What's this? He asks, coming at last to the cabinet with my many small drawers under the staircase. It's where my mother once kept secret things. Secret things? Yes, I'm not quite sure how to explain it. Lots of different things, all unfamiliar to me. Well, there's nothing left. When I was little, each drawer held one item. When she was taking a break from her work, she would... Show me the things and tell me stories about them. Strange stories like nothing I'd ever read in my picture books. I wonder why they're empty now. I don't know. But, but at some point, I, I realized everything was gone. Thing must have happened in the confusion when the memory place took her away. I think she must have found a way to dispose of them between the time they sent her the summons and her surrender. And this is when we learn about the emerald. The object my mother told me was most precious, I said after a long pause was an heirloom from her own mother that she kept in a drawer on the second row right above her. A little green stone, tiny and hard, like a baby tooth had just fallen out. I think I remember it that way because my own baby teeth were falling out about then. Could the green stone have been called an emerald? He added. em er -ald. I murmured over and over. Of course, that was it. em er -ald. I'm sure that's right, but how did you know? He said nothing for a moment. Instead, he began opening the drawers again, one after another. 
This one held perfume, he said. There's still some here. He gently pressed on her back to force her closer. Can you smell it? I'm sorry. I sighed, shaking my head. Don't apologize, he said. It's very hard to recall things that have disappeared. He blinked and closed the perfume drawer. But I remember, he added, the beauty of the emerald and the smell of the perfume. I haven't forgotten anything. Ooh, what a great place to end the story so far. Uh, R remembers something. So he has this genetic trait, if it is a genetic trait at all. We're not quite sure yet. So I'm really curious to know what you think. Let me know in the comments, are you enjoying the book so far? Was there something that I didn't cover that you would like to talk about in more detail? Also, there's a Discord to join with a channel dedicated to this book, as always. But yeah, I'm really enjoying this book so far. It's quiet. It's cozy. It's deliberately paced. It's a slow, slow burn. And yet I'm intrigued. I hope you are too. So I will see you next week with chapters 9 to 14 of The Memory Police. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for watching. Thanks for reading along with me. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.